Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, July 3rd, 2016. Talk about a classic Friday soap opera episode. Ian Ward shoots Victor, takes Nikki hostage, and Mariah's gonna have one hell of a headache when she wakes up in the morning. <laughs> you have to admit, Friday's show is a good show. Kind of makes me proud to be a soap opera fan. Everything I love about soap operas was kind of encapsulated in Friday's episode. And it's weird because the week started out really slow. The, there were a lot of slow, intimate moments between Adam and Chelsea. He's on house arrest. They're both realizing that he's on borrowed time because the trial is starting this week and he may very well not be coming home from it. So there was a mix of emotion and also light drama throughout the beginning of the week, but the real meat <laughs> did not start happening maybe until around Wednesday's show. Um, and certainly it, builded, it, it built up into Friday. I, I really, really loved the scene where Chelsea goes to visit Ian Ward to help reassure him that the escape plan she and Adam have set up for him in exchange for his testimony at Adam's trial is still on. It's still good. It's legit. It was a genius interaction on both of their parts. I loved Ian Ward walking into the room and the very first order of business for him is whether or not he's going to have a, a better looking suit than Victor <laughs> when it comes to the trial. He's sitting across from a fashion designer and he wants to make sure that in addition to the larger plan <laughs> that they have set up for him, he is wearing a dapper suit. The suit makes the man, he claims. <laughs> that was really funny and I thought Chelsea handled herself really well in that moment but the player of the week for me I mean from from Monday to Friday had to be Ian Ward he was fantastic I loved him in that scene with her I loved her turning on the fake waterwork tears and him kind of falling for it and just watching all of the reactions on his face as she was crying and telling her story and seeing him turn and just the way he smiles this big Cheshire cat grin and I mean anticipating what exactly he's gonna do because the trial did start I think it was on Friday it was the first time we actually made it into the courtroom and I, I was on I had bated breath waiting for what Ian Ward was gonna do of course I did like and appreciate Dylan taking the stand and giving his honest company man stance <laughs> under crickets of uh, fiery questioning sure sure <laughs> poor cricket she just she 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 always loses she's she's just destined to lose i think but um you know we know that dylan doesn't entirely believe that adam is guilty and yet when questioned about it he has to skirt around it and try to take the official stance that you know his job is just to collect the evidence it's the jury's job to make the decision so i did like seeing dylan on the stand i and i also really liked nick's surprise support of Adam. I was 100% expecting Nick to sit up there and say, Adam did it. He, he This is exactly the kind of thing he would do. But Nick didn't do that. He actually says he believes that Victor was the one who framed Adam. That Victor is vindictive enough to want to, to do that to Adam and to everyone else in his family. So that was kind of a changing and surprising moment for Nick. But it was Ian Ward just sauntering up to the stand <laughs> that really it was my moment of the week it was my happiness of the week he just makes it for me I loved that he walked in in his suit that he seemed very proud of and he stood there first promising to swear on a stack of Bibles that he is going to tell the truth uh, on the stand yeah right I, that I think 
that was probably the, the first moment of the week that I just really had this huge, huge grin knowing that something was coming, knowing that we were going to be building to something big. And as he sits there and tells his his story, he insists, oh, there's, there's nothing in it for me. I'm just telling this story uh, out of the goodness of my heart, just, just for my own spirituality. You know, spiritually, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. It was so purely Ian Ward. And I mean, what a great villain. It just doesn't get any better than that. And oddly, to his credit, the liar keeps his word. And he goes through with telling the jury that Victor confessed to him everything about framing Adam. And I was surprised. I sort of expected Ian to throw a twist in there, but he actually told the truth. You could see, um, especially after Chris's rather short uh, presentation for the prosecution, <clears throat> you could see the wave of relief on Adam and Chelsea's face. Even the witnesses that Chris did call didn't really take the hardline stance that, uh, that she wanted them to. I mean, Dylan said a lot in his testimony without saying anything. And then Nick's surprise twist, we have the testimony of Ian Ward. Looking at Chelsea and Adam's face, they seemed relieved and happy that maybe he was was actually going to get get out of this mess, these charges for this crime that he didn't really uh, commit. I mean, for crying out loud, there's no real evidence. And Michael made a point of pointing out that any evidence that there is was completely circumstantial. So that was looking really good for Adam. And then Chris calls Victor Newman to the stand and Victor is like walking into the courtroom as Ian Ward is walking out of the courtroom and they butt heads a little bit on, on their as they're crossing paths. I really like those two interacting together too. I can't decide at this point who I think is the bigger villain, Victor or Ian, to be completely honest with you, but I really like seeing those two in the scene together. And as Victor walks up to take his seat, I'm completely assuming that he is going to say that Adam is this horrible, terrible person and he is going to somehow like pull out of his pocket and uh, the ace up his sleeve of this whole setup that has occurred, that he has facilitated here. I'm expecting Victor has some little piece of evidence that he's tucked away that he's now going to reveal on the stand that's going to be the final nail in Adam's coffin. Um, but just at the last minute, he decides to completely change his story and pull the plug and say that he thinks Ian Ward is setting Adam up for this murder. So Victor pulls out. I mean, I'm, I'm so confused. Why, why did Victor go to the trouble of setting up Adam when we know he did it? I mean, we saw him hand the mystery woman exactly the words that were supposed to be forged in the diary. I mean, I, we saw it in a flashback, unless that was just him dreaming. We know that Victor was the one who was behind the diary. So why would he go to the trouble of doing all of this just to change his mind in the 11th hour and save Adam? I mean, was he just trying to create this whole trauma for Adam only to be the savior in the end? Or was that a last minute decision where he decided maybe after seeing Connor, maybe after seeing Chelsea, maybe that he just decided to change his mind and actually put family first rather than just preaching it all the time? I'm not sure. I would really like to hear what you guys have to say about that. What is, what was the motive behind Victor's actions there because I was not expecting it and Chris certainly wasn't expecting it either. The only rebuttal that she had when Victor changed from the story she thought he was going to tell was to say, well, wait a minute, what about Meredith? We have a prison employee who came to the police and said that you told her you had some irrefutable evidence that Adam did, in fact, murder Constance Bingham. And it seemed like, oh, well, gotcha there, Victor. But no, 
Rather than actually telling the truth about that, Victor just crumpled Meredith up and tossed her right underneath that proverbial bus, telling everyone in the courtroom that, oh yeah, she went to the police because she had a crush on me. She thought she was helping me because I'm Victor Newman and I'm so irresistible. She just, you know, lost her mind with passion for me that she went to the cops and just told them that. I mean, wh what? After everything that Meredith did for Victor, no wonder he was trying to convince her not to go the tr to the trial because he was going to just use her and toss her away. I really couldn't believe it. She, This woman has had unwavering support from for him. I don't know why I should be surprised in any way that he would betray her, considering that's exactly what he's done to Nikki for all of these years. Nikki gave him unconditional love and support over the years, and time and time again, he treated it as if it, it wasn't worthy or it wasn't good enough. So here he is doing the same thing to Meredith. I shouldn't be shocked. She shouldn't be shocked. I guess it's just that she seems innocent in a way, unless there's another twist down the road, which I'd like to see, like maybe if she's working with Ian Ward or something. But un unless there's another twist, Meredith, Meredith just seems naive and to, to have him betray her like that, it's like, okay, when Victor does something to Adam or Victoria or even Nick, there's a little bit of back and forth there. There's a lot of history in those relationships. I think that Adam, Jack, those are worthy opponents for Victor, but Meredith is just this bystander and he completely throws her reputation under the bus. I was incensed by that. Was I the only one? I mean, how humiliating for her. I just thought, oh, what an a-hole. <laughs> That's right. I said it. Victor was being a real a-hole when he did that. <laughs> oh me. Oh my. I, her face so, as he as he left the stand and passed her on the way, she just looked at him with absolute warranted disgust. I don't know what the heck she is going to do now. I guess I guess maybe ultimately she did kind of get what was coming to her, but Victor's losing, get this, his favorite prize physician <laughs> right when he needs one the most because just as Victor's like exiting off the stand, Ian has his own guard try and he's he's exiting off to, to to where he thinks is going to be his big escape. The guard kind of leads him through this back corridor where Adam and Chelsea have told him there's going to be a janitor waiting for him who is going to take out the guard and help him escape to safety. But as soon as Ian Ward rounds the corner, realizes there's nobody there and that he has been had, he just absolutely flips out, knows that Adam and Chelsea have set him up, so Ian Ward, this 70-year-old man, easily disarms this armed guard. <laughs> Come on, where are they training the police in this town? Ian grabs this guy's gun, where, by the way, Nikki happens to be Dan, she, Nikki's like taking a courtroom breather, maybe 10 feet away, looking all fabulous in her red suit. She, she might as well have been one of those red cloths that the bullfighter waves in front of the bull. Ian Ward probably just looked over, saw her in red, and then grabs her, pretty much takes her hostage at gunpoint. And all of this is happening just as Victor is being brought out with his armed guard out of the actual courtroom itself. The guard, Victor's guard, sees that Ian Ward is standing there with a gun pointed toward this woman. So the guard, of course, draws his weapon, aims it at Ian, and is getting ready to fire when Victor grabs the gun and put, pushes the gun away out of the guard's hands. Like this guard was going to shoot Ian. Victor pushes the gun out of the way, and then when Ian fires back, Victor takes the bullet. So Victor's shot. I don't understand for the life of me why that had to happen. Why 
did Victor grab the gun? Somebody help me understand this. The guard was gonna take out the prisoner, not the beautiful lady in red. Nikki probably would have been safe. I don't understand why Victor had to intervene. Was it just that he couldn't bear the thought of a bullet going into Nikki's direction? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I knew, though. <laughs> I knew last week when Nikki mentioned that the divorce was going to be finalized within the next two weeks. Just the fact that she said it's going to be the next two weeks, I thought to myself, something is going to intervene that is going to stop that divorce. Because if YNR wanted the divorce to be final, it would be final. They wouldn't go out of their way to mention it's going to be happening in about two weeks. So knowing that from last week, I am telling you with certainty right now that Nikki will be swooning by Monday's show about how Victor saved her life. You know, it was only a couple of weeks ago that Kevin was insisting to Mariah that he was not sleeping with Natalie. And then this week, when he confronts Natalie about her involvement with the oil spill, it's implied that they're full on sleeping together. So which is it, Kevin? What do you want, man? <laughs> Who do you want, man? Your, and your choice may be getting all the more difficult uh, to make if what I think is happening is, is, is actually happening. But I, I actually really like Natalie. I, I think that this, this sort of riched up version of the geek girl is really working for me. She, of course, denied that she had any involvement with uh, the oil spill and Victor and all of that. And I liked how funny she was about hacking into, I mean, hacking into the computer and all this stuff and proving her own innocence. I thought she was really cute with heaven, Kevin. And I think that they do actually make a pretty good couple, but they're there was a little bit of doubt as to whether or not Kevin believed her. So Kevin decided to go to the jail to visit Victor and see if, I don't know, Victor would just tell him <laughs> all of his secrets, <laughs> which of course wasn't going to work out. But I tell you, if, if I never have to see one more visit in that jail, I'll be happy. This is, this is Victor's prison sentence of 10 years has been like the longest 10 years of my entire life. How long have we been in jail, you guys? I swear, I think it's been since March or something. It's It's been quite a while. It's really starting to wear on me. I don't know how Victor getting shot is going to end up factoring into his prison sentence, I highly doubt that they're going to decide to just let him go because he took a bullet. Well, I, I don't know if maybe they're going to decide that there's too much danger for Victor in prison and let him out on house arrest. I'm not sure, but if I never have to see him in denim again, if I never have to sit in that prison office, Victor's office in prison again, I'll be happy. <laughs> so I, I'll be glad also when this storyline uh, progresses, um, Kevin, while he is in the jail, happens to notice that there's a security camera that is recording video footage of all of Victor's meetings, all of everybody's meetings. I mean, there's no audio, which would be helpful, but apparently um, there's video surveillance and guests do have to sign in. So... Kevin is able to crack the security footage with Natalie and get those aerial from the back photos of the woman who is visiting Victor, the mystery woman. But she never happens to turn around and show her face to the camera conveniently. But we get that back of the head shot. And then Kevin goes to the prison record, sign in records, and finds out that this woman has come to see. Victor and signed into the prison using the name Dorothy Gale. Ding, ding, ding! The second. 
Those words came out of Kevin's mouth. I said, oh, it is written. Let there be no further doubt about who the mystery woman is, my friends. If you haven't already figured it out, I will tell you, Dorothy Gale is Chloe Mitchell. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, in my mind at least, I think this is a really nice tie-in. I'm a huge Wizard of Oz fan, so as soon as he said Dorothy Gale, I was like, ooh, Wizard of Oz! <laughs> but they went on to explain that that is indeed the name of the lead character in The Wizard of Oz, which just so happened to be one of Delia's favorite movies, which just so happened to be the play that she was performing in as the Wicked Witch of the West on the night she unfortunately was killed. So that is, to me, is the, the hugest red flag possible to um, to let me know that, that it's Chloe, that the rumors must be true, that Chloe is coming back. I believe it 100%. I think that Victor's being shot is here to give us a delay on Adam's trial and stretch out the amount of time that Kevin has to figure out who it is that this mystery woman is that could actually help Adam save the day, who could that could get to the bottom of who's behind the oil spill. This is Kevin's mystery to figure it out. And I think that's also uh, the, another obvious connection to Chloe that's a very delicious connection to Chloe. It's going to be delicious that Kevin is going to be the one to figure out that that's who it is, that Chloe's back in town, that Chloe's, I guess, working with Victor, that she's behind all of this craziness. I am, I'm just dying to know when they're going to drop this bomb. I don't know if YNR is going to even pursue it next week or if we're going to have to wait a little bit longer, but I'm dying to find out. The number, I mean, as soon as all the mystery woman stuff and connection to Victor is wrapped up, I barely even care about about that because the number one question on my list is who is the father of Chloe's daughter? Is it Kevin or is it Billy? Even though Natalie wasn't involved in the second oil spill disaster, she does admit to Victoria that she was someone who looked into the first oil spill questioning and that and she did it on Billy's behalf. Billy did ask her to hack into Victoria's computer to get the to get information on that first oil spill. So Victoria knows right away that Billy had something to do with something thing or she suspects anyway and she marches off to confront Billy and it's not that wild of an idea. As soon as Victoria came to the conclusion and started to question Billy about his involvement with that, I thought, well, this is very reasonable. I mean, he did buy Brash and Sassy out from under her, yet as she was talking to him, he was spinning it in a direction saying, oh, I would never do that to hurt you. I bought Brash and Sassy because I wanted to protect your family's company and something that you love. I didn't want somebody else to buy it, which to me is a complete and total lie. You can't say in one breath that you would never do something to hurt Victoria when you purely bought Brash and Sassy to hurt Victoria. There's no question about it in my mind anyway. So everything that was coming out of his mouth through the rest of that whole conversation to me seemed like complete BS. And it was, it was the way Billy does these bad things and then acts all offended. He's really good. Billy is actually a pretty good manipulator. He's a pretty good liar. He acts all offended that Victoria would even assume that he had anything to do with it because they share children together and yada yada. Um, but I will give Billy credit for this. He was right about one thing. He told Victoria, look, instead of accusing me of being involved in this, maybe you need to take a look at some of the other people in your life. All, for instance, Luca, and also for instance, Travis. Now, I mean, Luca, no doubt about it. He is a snake in the grass. Whether he is, whether it's, it's YNR playing the obvious, 
game here and Luca's completely behind the oil spill, obviously, or if there's a twist down the road and something else is going on and it's Travis, I think that Billy was right. Victoria is definitely blinded to the more obvious things, the more obvious aspects and people about who might be behind the oil spill. It might still be Victor. We might find out at the end of the day that Victor is just behind both of these things. So we really don't know. Uh, but last week's poll question was pretty much a clean sweep of agreement. Travis, good guy or secret bad guy? 82% of you said, I think Travis is a total good guy. So I think most of the YNR chatters are pretty obviously Team Travis here. Although I will admit to you, I was in the 18% that voted secret bad guy. I can't help it. That's not to say that I don't really like Travis because I really do. I think he's very cute. I think he's very charming. He and Victoria are probably YNR's hottest new couple right now. There's just something very down to earth about him. I talked last week about his Matt Damon vibe, which I'm still getting and falling for all week. Don't get me wrong, but I just cannot put aside my suspicious nature. There's just something in me that says, YNR's not just gonna play this straight. I mean, we don't know. At this point, YNR could, their jury could still be out. They could still be deciding how they wanna take the direction of the character. But to me, I just think, I wonder if maybe he started out being a bad guy and fell in love with her somewhere along the way, but she's certainly in love with him and she's certainly sort of blinded a little bit, I think, and or at least she has the capability of being blinded by his charms. I just don't want to fall for it too. If he turns out to be a bad guy, I don't just want to be swooning over here over him. <laughs> oh, but I was on his side completely when Billy tromps up in that man's bar and starts to confront him. What right really does Billy have to get all up in Victoria's business to start asking questions of her new bo boyfriend and I mean aside from everything else why go to Travis why not go to Luca Luca's that obvious snake in the grass if you want to go confront somebody for taking advantage of Victoria it's Luca he was having her photographed even Nick knows that and then they allow Luca to be in the same room with them and they treat him as if he's a valued employee of Newman Enterprises it doesn't make sense that no one's looking at Luca and either that is a, a, a red herring or I don't know <laughs> I don't know but the fact that Billy would go directly to Travis about this says to me why why does it you know why why Travis? Why does Billy seem extra interested in this guy now that Victoria is falling for him and that they're obviously in love? And I can't help asking myself if there's any chance that maybe Billy's reasoning for getting up on Travis and getting all aggressive with them, I mean, he didn't have to grab him by his collar. I'm wondering if that has anything more to do with possible feelings for Victoria or is he just being protective of the mother of his children but going up into the guy's bar it didn't take any time at all I mean it was it was like from zero to a hundred in three seconds and Billy had his hands on him and he was ready to wring his neck and worst of all and rudest of all Billy had the nerve at the very end of it to insult the man's beer. How rude. I would also like to go on record as saying, I don't think Billy paid for that beer. <laughs> I think 
Suzuki went into Travis's bar, ordered a beer, didn't pay for it, and then told Travis it tasted like sewage. And it's just, there's certain things you don't do. <laughs> and insulting a man's business is one of them. Um, on to other topics. You know, the other shocking, head-smashing moment of the week uh, came from Mariah and Sharon. It is, it, it is really hard to watch how Sharon and Mariah's relationship has gone from sort of non-existent to really supportive and now to adversarial and to know that Mariah has such a good heart and I think she's really trying to help Sharon by counseling her and and keeping her secret. I think Mariah is such a good friend and confidant to Sharon and has done nothing but try to get Sharon to uh, at least take care of herself and Sharon the wheels are just coming off so fast and there's and Sharon doesn't have any direction anymore she is spinning out but Mariah early in the week offered to go kind of undercover with Sharon's story and take it to a psychiatrist and see what the psychiatrist might say as far as getting rid of Sharon's nightmares. Uh, Mariah did learn that Sharon has been having the nightmares about Sage, wants to help, and, sa and Sharon says, look, no, as soon as I go to, to, my psych to, to my doctor and talk to her about what's going on, I'm gonna have to tell her the truth. As soon as I tell the truth, the doctor's gonna be obligated to go to the authorities so I can't do that. Mariah actually offers to do that for her, which is, it's just, could Mariah be doing anything more to help? It's like she's, Mariah's giving everything. She has totally tossed aside her own life. I mean, she wanted to be with Kevin. She didn't, you know, she wanted, she moved out of that house and came and, and you know, decided to help take care of the baby with Sharon and to be with Sharon. I mean, Mariah has really sacrificed everything of her own personal life now to get wrapped up in Sharon's madness and it's only getting worse and worse. Mariah discovers this week or at least suspects this week that Sharon is completely off her meds which I didn't really realize or pick up on until this week. I assumed that the sage hauntings were just part of her conscience. I guess it's it's escalated quite a lot because it's not just Sharon seeing a flash of sage in the corner. Now it's becoming Sharon sort of blipping in and out of reality and thinking that Sage is right there beside her. And we're seeing and arguments between Sharon and Sage, you know, or Sharon and, and Ghost Sage. I mean, Sharon almost seems to really believe that Sage is there, that she has to justify her actions. She keeps getting spooked. She's having other types of hallucinations. Like there was this really cool effect that YNR did sort of showing from Sharon's perspective the walls moving around and changing perspective. It was it was almost like a visual representation of the walls closing in on Sharon, which is very true of, of where she is in her life and maybe where we are in the story. It's it was funny because I think YNR spent some money on special effects this week because we had that weird shot with Sharon in the walls and and then we had also that superimposed shot of Adam's face like he's actually in his condo looking out the window thinking about going to prison and they superimpose the, this like scrolling line of prison cells in the background behind Adam's face so uh, that Weiner decided to put a little cash cash down on giving us some neat and different special effects this week which I very much appreciated thank you Weiner um, but Sharon is now to the point where it's it's just escalated beyond where she can control it and being off of her meds is not helping at all. I can't imagine what made her decide to go off 
of the meds, if indeed she is, which I assume she is. I mean, it, it, the, probably the more and more she's gone off the meds, the more and more she's seen the sage hallucinations. And the beautiful thing about the sage hallucinations is that they're becoming more and more real and sort of, um, I wish I could think of a good word for it, like sassy almost. Like at first, Sage, Ghost Sage, was silent and just sort of looking at Sharon and maybe would say a little something here and there. And now it's become full on dialogues where Sage is almost taunting her and laughing at her. I mean, it's really represented the devolution of Sharon's mental state. And it all culminates in Sharon sort of having this split reality where she's talking to Mariah, having an argument with Mariah about what she should do about the sage and the hallucination and the doctor and all on her meds and Mariah's confronting her about her meds and all of that. And Sharon will at one moment be talking to Mariah and then she'll blip out and see Sage over in the corner and she'll start yelling at Sage and Mariah first realizes, whoa, this has gotten worse than even I thought. I thought you were just having dreams. Now all of a sudden she realizes Sharon is physically seeing Sage and it's also a weird callback to when Mariah was haunting Sharon and making her think that it was Cassie and there's been other weird callbacks throughout throughout the week in this Sharon situation and her mental health issues well the sage ghost at one point steps right in between Sharon and Mariah and Sharon just cannot take it anymore the woman picks up this owl shaped bookend and whacks it at what she thinks is Sage, but it's actually Mariah. She funks Mariah over the head. Mariah goes down. You can see she's got a head wound. She's starting to bleed a little bit. What the hell is Sharon gonna do now? We saw from the previews of Monday's show that Kevin's gonna walk on into the house looking for Mariah, and Mariah's looking like she's dead on the floor. Sharon's standing over her, probably still got the bloody bookend in her hand. That's kind of reminded me, by the way, of, uh, of the bloody bookend that Summer had in her hand when uh, Austin got hit over the head at the Abbott cabin, which has another weird callback for this week but we'll talk about that next what the heck is she gonna do how is she gonna talk her way out of this this has got to be the last straw for Mariah Mariah is not going to continue making excuses for Sharon especially now that she's whacked her over the head I mean that's a whole new level if if Mariah is able to sit up and walk I mean is there any chance Mariah's gonna have some kind of weird amnesia please tell me that this is not gonna result in Mariah having amnesia and not knowing any of Sharon's secrets I hope that's not what's gonna happen I'm hoping she wakes up and uh, realizes that this cannot go on and becomes the catalyst for the secret coming out because I just feel bad for her right now. Uh, all I could think was, owl, that's gotta hurt. It's not enough that you're sleeping with your husband's brother, but then you forget his birthday too. I mean, you're really, really not going to win any awards for Wife of the Year, Phyllis. Sorry to tell ya. She forgot Jack's birthday. I wanted to cry a river for this man on top of everything else that's happened to him that he doesn't even know about. Phyllis completely forgets his birthday until meddling Ashley <laughs> reminds uh, her of it. And it's so interesting because... I tell you, Ashley had to try really, really hard to convince Phyllis to, to, to do something for Jack other than sitting at home and doing nothing. And Phyllis kept trying to fight it. Ashley was suggesting doing something romantic and Phyllis actually said to her, you know, I don't think we should, we're gonna do anything like that. You know us, we're married, we're boring. And I thought that kind of sums up maybe a little bit of where uh, Phyllis's mental state is right now. With Jack, 
it's predictable, it's nice, it's comfortable, it's marriage, it's boring. It has stopped having the thrill of what she gets with Billy, which is this hot, unpredictable, naughty affair. I thought that just summed it up really well. Why go on a nice getaway with Jack when you can be sneaking off in the corner and having sex with his brother? But Ashley pushes the issue so hard that uh, she ends up having to agree to this cabin getaway with Jack. Uh, it was kind of nice that we saw, did you guys notice the little exterior shot of the cabin? I like when YNR gives us these outdoor um, ideas of, like we see the inside of the cabin set all the time, but occasionally they'll give us sort of this exterior shot of what it looks like. It didn't look anything like I thought it would. It's always like that. I, I create this picture in my mind of, of what I think it looks like and it, it never matches when they give it to us, that exterior shot to us. But I did appreciate getting to see that anyway. Um, but Phyllis doesn't want to go to the cabin. Billy managed to, manages to catch whiff before they even left that she's thinking about going to the cabin and he tries to get her not to go and or to not sleep with Jack while she's there. He actually tells her, I don't want, I don't want you to go because I don't want to think about you sleeping with him. They're married. <laughs> don't you think? that they're gonna sleep together. I mean, you know that that's what's gonna happen. You cannot have your cake and eat it too, yet they all, they both, Phyllis and Billy, want to have their cake and eat it too. But the truth is, Phyllis doesn't wanna sleep with Jack. I mean, like, sex is off the table for poor Jackie boy. The second they get to the cabin, you can feel that Phyllis doesn't wanna be there. She's trying to get out. She wants him to go for a walk or anything. Let's do anything except be anywhere near a bed together. She's just squirming around. She's trying to like wriggle out of every embrace that he wants to give her, every kiss, every touch. Oh Lord, when he gives her that gift. I mean, he what a sweet guy here. It's his birthday. She's done nothing for him, nothing. <laughs> and he has, he manages to pull through and get a gift for her. She opens it up and it's this little nighty. It's a little black piece of lingerie, which normally, the normal Phyllis would have been like, yeah, baby. She would have rushed off into the bedroom, put that thing on, and she would have danced around to get Jack's attention. But this time, oh, no, no, no. She couldn't get that away from her fast enough. She, it's like, it's she just obviously doesn't want to have anything to do with Jack. It's not just sex. It's any kind of intimacy. And I am just watching this scene thinking, hey, Phyllis, if you don't want to be with Jack, then why are you with Jack? Why don't you just leave him? Is it just that Jack's a nice guy and Jack's somebody you can lean on and Jack's somebody you can trust? Because that's called friend zone and that's not called marriage and it's not fair to Jack. If all you want from him are is the emotional support and you don't want to give anything back to him, then that's called a friend. It's just, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking, what, what does she need him for? I understand and I, I think it makes sense that Phyllis would not feel comfortable having sex with Jack after, you know, having had sex with his brother a bunch of times. <laughs> I think it, it's it's logical to me that she would feel kind of dirty or tainted or maybe like she's not good enough. And she even said that, you know, like you're better than me or you're too good for me or whatever. I think she feels, she, she understands that she's done something wrong. She's not gonna change it. Oh, don't get me wrong, she's not gonna stop. <laughs> but she knows she's done something wrong and it makes her feel less than worthy to be around Jack, but then just leave him. Instead, she decides to get all tipsy or fake getting tipsy to avoid him. She just starts pounding the champagne and then I think, I assume, pretends to be drunker than she actually was so that she can pass out on the couch and have an excuse not to be with him. I was so sad. He puts a blanket over her, takes good care of her, and goes, just he's so understanding 
understanding. He goes off to sleep. He tries to make her a hangover smoothie in the morning, which I'm not gonna lie, was a little obnoxious. <laughs> I did want to murder him for a second because I watched that episode real, like, I was barely awake yet. And the very first thing on, I guess it was Thursday's show, or maybe, yeah, Thursday's show, I guess it was. Uh, he, the very first thing I turn on is this blast of a blender. And I'm like, Jack. <laughs> you need to knock it off and he was not very good at operating the blender because it was like not even moving around it was just that annoying gnawing blending sound I, I, I did almost have to murder him but I was and as she she comes out of the room she's like Jack I'm like girl I get you on that <laughs> that's the one thing I can get I can get with you this week on was that annoying ass blender <laughs> but oh man she flies, she gets rid of him. She gets rid of Jack. She says, you know what? Adam's trial is starting. Why don't you just go back to Genoa City? I'll stay here and I don't want to be anywhere near it. So she makes up this kind of excuse to get Jack out of the cabin so that she can have this alone time, which quite frankly, I'm pretty sure she knew wasn't going to be alone time the entire time. And it, Jack was so heartbroken. He, he's not he, he's not completely stupid. He uh, is realizing that Phyllis is stressed or something more is going on and that she doesn't want to be around him. It really, I mean, it's not that hard to pick up on somebody not wanting you. And he's getting it now when she tries to send him away and obviously on his birthday doesn't even want to be around him. He, he leaves in kind of a negative place. He was like, you know what? Whatever. You know, you don't, it's fine. It's fine. You just stay here. You do whatever you're going to do. You're going to do it anyway. He had this little sort of resentment in his voice, which was entirely, um, uh, understandable of course and he just leaves and she feels bad about it but not bad enough I don't even know if she felt that bad I think she was just truly glad to get rid of him and naturally the second Jack gets back to town Jack does his thing and Billy finds out that oh Phyllis didn't come back with you she's up at the cabin alone ding 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 opportunity Billy <laughs> rushes up to the cabin to be with her and 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 of course they have this very passionate moment where he's not supposed to be there but you know she's secretly glad and was hoping that he was there and he's I think he was trying to ask her what happened last night like he was kind of grilling her about whether or not she slept with Jack and she tells him I, I didn't sleep with Jack because for some reason sleeping with Jack makes me feel like I'm cheating on you mmm <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that had to have been a, the best line of the week. That was, I, I know your jaws were dropping. Your jaws were dropping, your eyes were bugging out because that was like, whoa. Whether you are a Philly fan or not, that was a moment. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. She can't have, she didn't want to have sex with Jack because it felt like cheating on Billy. So she proceeds to have sex with Billy right there uh, on the couch in the ab uh, cabin. I just, I can only imagine that what Phyllis, uh, I, I want to say that what Phyllis wants is to have the physical intimacy with Billy, but she wants to get her emotional intimacy from Jack. But at the same time, I don't even think she's getting the emotional intimacy from Jack. I think the physical intimacy with Billy is sort of blocking out any kind of romantic connection or even friendship, really, that she and Jack could have. So I'm kind of left confused about what's going through Phyllis's mind right now. I'm, I mean, I do understand it on a certain level. I, I, I think it is identifiable. Um, I, I can understand what she's saying when she says it but at the same time I don't understand why she doesn't just leave Jack and maybe you guys can tell me that why doesn't Phyllis just leave Jack why is she instead having sex with Billy on the couch at the Abbott cabin when she damn well knows that Jack left his phone at that cabin. The problem is he's going to be coming back to that cabin. I will bet you a bowl of fruit salad and burnt toast <laughs> that Jack is going to be coming back for that phone.
I think they both want to get caught. Anyway, <laughs> if Devon and Hillary are breaking up, then Lily's gonna take this opportunity to, you know, kick Hillary's ass out of the athletic club. <laughs> what a great confrontation between Lily and Hillary at the beginning of the week. I watched it twice. I just thought it was so good. I mean, Hillary tries to, she catches whiff of, of the idea that Phyllis didn't plan a party for Jack, and so she's going to throw a little something, a little party for Jack. And Lily, Lily overhears Hillary saying this on her phone and cannot wait to confront her. And it was just another epic cat fight between these two. I absolutely love it. It culminated in Lily kicking Hillary out of the athletic club, which, of course, Hillary tries to use to her advantage with Jack. She tries to ingratiate herself with him, make herself look like the victim. Oh, Jack, I've been kicked out. Or I don't think she told him. I think she said she suddenly had to move, which is implied. Jack knows she's wanting to divorce Devon or that they're breaking up. Um, is, can you recommend a place for me to stay? I thought she was going to ask if she could stay with him. Who knows? Maybe she will. Maybe she'll be going through her divorce with Devon and need a place to stay and stay at the Abbott house. I don't know. But still, Jack is obviously uncomfortable with Hillary showing any signs of affection toward him. You know, because he's married and faithful. <laughs> he's not going to be letting some other woman grab on his hand in public. And you know, it's the right thing to do. Uh, so that didn't really go anywhere. I think Hillary just realized that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to fight for what I want. She goes back to the club, tosses her bag at Lily's feet and says, you know what, on second thought, if, we're, if I'm going to be divorcing Devon, this place, the athletic club, is considered marital property, so I'm going to fight for it. And as a matter of fact, you might want to be polishing up your resume because I'm probably going to own this place soon. Hillary knows what she wants. She knows how to get it. She's, if she's going to divorce Devon, she's going to take him for half. Half. Half of that big old Catherine Chancellor fortune, Devon, dummy, didn't get a prenup. I mean, come on, that's a lot of money to just be handing off to somebody to, that you haven't even been married to for a couple years. I mean, can you imagine Catherine Chancellor's fortune, half of it going to Hillary? I would die. There's a part of me that thinks that, oh gosh, I just can't allow it. It was hard enough for me to accept that Devon got all of her money, but for the purposes of the storyline, I did accept it. But if Hillary gets it, ooh, that's going to be a tough pill to swallow. Although I do still kind of like the idea of Hillary being filthy rich. <laughs> I just want to prop up this character for some reason. I, I can't seem to get enough. I say it every single week, but I kind of like, I would like the idea if she did maybe own the athletic club and Lily worked for her or that would be kind of, although she, you know, she'd fire her immediately. It would never happen. But I almost like the idea of giving Hillary a little something, uh, a, a little bit more money so she can, uh, I don't know, lord it over the rest of Genoa City, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, Lily and Kane have told Devon or encouraged him uh, to do anything necessary to protect his fortune, including trying to convince Hillary not to divorce him, which is a ridiculous plan. It's That's totally stupid. So basically, I think Neil was the one that put it this way. He can either... Uh, be in a shell of a marriage with Hillary and keep his money or he can divorce her and be free. I would divorce her and be free or fight her back. He's the one that's got billions of resources. He can hire lawyers to get himself around this. I don't know why he would have to continue to be in a marriage with her or pretend to be. That doesn't even seem like a logical solution. But at this point, Hillary, I, the one thing I will say that's getting kind of annoying about the Hillary storyline is the hand tremors only because it's it's starting to seem really fake because it's always one shot of a hand trimmer and then she's never tremoring in any other scene. She's able to completely 100% control it except for those moments where it's like absolutely uncontrollable and her hand is jazz handing all over the place. But other than that, she's perfectly normal. Um, Dr. Neville has 
come up with his miracle cure. I can't even look at him anymore because I know he's leaving and I'm just expecting one, then probably the next time we see him, he's gonna say, oh, my work here is done and now I must go off and help someone else in Brazil or something. There'll be some reason why he has to leave. Maybe we'll get a cheerful goodbye with Ashley. I'm not looking forward to it. I don't, I don't think I can handle it, but he does, he's discovered a hopefully miracle cure for Hillary. She's in the hospital getting ready to get the treatment when when Devon tracks her down to put his plan in action, plan convince Hillary to still be with me in action, and he actually did seem like, I don't know, genuinely turned around on her when she started to explain how sick she was. He really didn't know any of this. Jack knew she was sick, Ashley knew she was sick, Neville, I, I, but Devon didn't even know any of this was going on with his wife. And she started to explain it. She seemed scared. She seemed vulnerable. And Devon, I think, maybe got a different perspective on what she's been going through. I think maybe she might have convinced him that, uh, that she needed somebody. I mean, I just, as hard as I'm trying I just can't see Jack and Hillary as a couple, and so there's a part of me that's thinking, okay, maybe a long, slow build back to Devon and Hillary would be good, but we've got some work to, to, to do to get there because I would bet you that she's gonna wake up from this treatment probably with a whole new attitude toward her billion dollar husband. I just am wondering if maybe Hillary is gonna all of a sudden become the wife that Devon has always wanted her to be, and then there goes Lillian Kane's plan to get her out of Devon's life altogether. Free advice is worth every penny. I love that line. You gotta admit, we do have some good writers on YNR. Free advice is worth every penny. It was Billy who said that last week. He actually said it to Summer, who is making much more of a routine out of butting into other people's lives and relationships. And Billy, who always has had a lot of good zingers, uh, decided to zing that right Summer's way. Uh, quite a few people got that one right this week. Um, Victoria, Mary, Austin, and Naomi, they always get it right. Uh, Roy Perkins, uh, September, Chris King, Troy, John, Christopher, and Ellen C. <laughs> they all got that quote right for the week, but can you do it again? Who said it this week? Are you calling me old? <laughs> If you think you know who said that line, are you calling me old? <laughs> you can go to yrchat.com and leave your guess. If you guess correctly and you give one correct guess, I've had a lot of people this past week saying, well, it could have been this person or that person. Nope doesn't count. You have to know who it was <laughs> and only one time. Uh, if you can get that right, um, then I will give you your shout out during next week's YNR chat. So yrchat.com. Are you calling me old? Katie on Facebook says, can we just label the theme of this week mixed signals? <laughs> Everyone's confusing me. Phyllis, Billy, Hillary, these people are making me dizzy. <laughs> I think Sharon's also making Mariah dizzy, as a matter of fact, but yes, mixed signals, I agree. Uh, Lindy left me a voicemail, and she made a very good point that I hadn't thought about. It. She just simply says, what happened to Nurse Stevens, the uh, doctor who did the baby switch and is the one who told Sage about uh, Christian's still being alive and that it was with Sharon and all that. You know, I think that's a good question. And I somebody else mentioned that on YouTube this week, that they were wondering if maybe Nurse Stevens was somehow involved with Victor. And I do wonder if YNR is by any chance going to bring back that character um, and maybe that will usher in the baby truth. I don't know. But the, for that matter, I will also add, Lindy, whatever happened to Patty? Because Patty seemed to be in the know on all of this. Is there any chance that Patty will come back onto the scene and talk to Paul or Dylan 
and tell him the truth about the baby secret. I mean, Patty is still someone out there who knows the truth, who is sort of a recurring character, and who it would be interesting seeing to seeing a busting a Sharon out. I wouldn't mind that at all. Um, Lindy, by the way, also says she thinks I should do a Bold and the Beautiful podcast or, or vlog. I thought about it in the past. It just would be so much work. Why in our chat does actually take a lot of work for as effortless as I make it seem. I don't know if I can pull it off for Bold and the Beautiful. I'm always behind, but I will tell you, if any of you guys out there are looking to pick up another show and you haven't seen Why in our Sister Soap, it's only a half hour show. If you're watching it online, maybe 20 minutes. It's really good, and I'll tell you the single greatest reason why I watch Bold and the Beautiful is a man named Don Diamond as Bill Spencer. I mean, he was Brad Carlton on The Young and the Restless. I loved him for years. I was absolutely devastated when they killed him, and I am just so glad that I get to experience him on Bold and the Beautiful. And there are a lot of other Young and the Restless characters, um, uh, former Young and the Restless characters, uh, who are on there. Heather Tom, who used to play Victoria. It's a good show, I think. I mean, I'm into it now. I think I've been watching it long enough to where I can pick up the cues, and it's I'm in, I'm hooked. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't... I don't know if I'll be able to pull off a podcast or a vlog, but that does kind of remind me of uh, us talking last week about other shows that it would be kind of fun for The Young and the Restless to do a crossover with. Mayanar doesn't seem to do as many crossovers with Bold and the Beautiful and, and vice versa anymore. I don't know why, why they don't do that anymore, but a couple people mentioned some other shows that they'd like to see Mayanar do a crossover with. Tanya says General Hospital. I mean, I don't I, yeah, the soaps really rarely do any kind of uh, crossing over. I'm sure it's probably because they're competitive, but it, you know, I think actually, you know, you, you mentioned it though. It's like so, so many of the actors on Young and the on General Hospital have come to YNR. It's almost like we're watching a uh, a crossover and and vice versa. Uh, Zooperplex says X Files. Oh, I haven't seen the new version of the X Files, but I did watch the original run, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty good show. <laughs> that would be interesting to see YNR with an an alien theme or something. John Christopher says Tr Two Broke Girls. That's a CBS show. I'm sure they could probably swing that. Um, let me look at a couple other of these. Judge Judy <laughs> Fox Rock says Judge Judy. Yeah, she'd be a really good judge to have on there. I think that's CBS too. Beatrice says Big Bang Theory or Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> I like that too. Oh my goodness. Um, I, shoot, I, I could sit here and read all these, but I won't. Connor says Big Brother. Connor's watching Big Brother. I'm watching Big Brother just as an FYI. I, I love CBS shows. I watch Survivor too, uh, but I do, I do. I'm watching, not only am I watching Big Brother, but I've been kind of addicted to the feeds. I'll listen to the live feeds while I'm working. It's kind of fun. <laughs> but if you want to read all of the suggestions, uh, go to yrchat.com. And if you haven't left your idea for a YNR crossover, you should definitely do that. Um, let's see. Oh, Gary had called and left me a voicemail and said that Heather Tom was on the talk this past week. I got to remember to look that up because I really do like her. She's directed a couple episodes of The Bold and the Beautiful, um, and she seems like a smart cookie, so I should definitely uh, check that out. Gary also had kind of honed in on something uh, with Sharon that I, I couldn't quite, I didn't get. Um, Mariah had mentioned that Sharon had been hypnotized before, and Gary said it had something to do with Summer's paternity secret. I, I feel like I should remember, and I, yet I can't remember. I, what was the hypnosis session that Sharon went through, and did it have something to do with uh, Summer's paternity? Was she trying to remember that she was the one that did that in the first place? I'm kind of I'm kind of loose on that memory. So memory. So if anybody wants to jog me, please feel free. Also, I love Gary's. I think this is the joking theory uh, that Mar. Marco is back, uh, noticing that Jack is feeling a little frisky this week, and Gary uh, uh, jokingly, I think, speculated that uh, that might mean that uh, Jack is really Marco. <laughs> you know how much he really loved that Phyllis, and then Gary says, uh, and then look at Jack at the courthouse on Friday. What do we see? 
the real Jack Abbott doesn't wear purple ties, remember? <laughs> I swear, Gary, every single time I see Jack in a purple tie, I have to reel myself back in and not say something about it because the purple tie scandal of that whole storyline was so ridiculous, I couldn't believe it. And I, I'll never, ever let it go. Purple tie will always be Marco. <laughs> uh, Sandra at YRChat.com says... You know it's really bad when you deny your partner birthday sex by fake sleeping on the couch. Oh, really? I agree, Sandra. Phyllis needs to get with that. Look, here's the thing. Ladies, you know, sometimes... <laughs> Look, sometimes you just have to, like, lie there <laughs> and just accept it. <laughs> you couldn't at least maybe get take a couple swigs of that champagne to loosen yourself up to to just go through it just to give the man a little we don't not every time not every sex is affair naughty affair sleeping with your other husband's brother sex sometimes you just got to get it over with <laughs> <laughs> and I think Phyllis should have just bit the bullet and just gone through with it and gave Jack a little birthday thumb thumb. <laughs> uh, Connor at YRChat.com says, Billy is really annoying the hell out of me right now. He's such a hypocrite, just like Phyllis. Like, dude, you've been professing your love and lust for Phyllis, but you're all up in Travis's face. Jealous that Victoria found better? Get a grip on reality, Billy Boy Abbott. You had your shot with Vicky, but you blew it. Yes. And T. Nicole at YRChat.com says, maybe Ashley Abbott has it right. And whoever this new mystery woman is of Billy's, which we know is Phyllis, is just a rebound from Victoria. I feel Billy might not even know who he wants. Well, I would like to get your opinion on that this week. In fact, we will make that this week's poll question. Does Billy still have feelings for Victoria? I mean, I, I keep trying to force myself to believe that Billy's feelings for Phyllis have love in them. And yet then he turns around and he gets very overly protective of Victoria. And Victoria even said something um, to, to Travis, I think, this week that she thinks Billy just doesn't like the fact that she's falling in love again. So I'm really curious to know where you guys stood on Billy's reaction to Victoria and Travis. Do you think that Billy still is in love with Victoria? YRChat.com if you want to cast your vote on that. Edith uh, on the website says, uh, in regards to the poll question from last week, is Travis a good guy or a bad guy? Edith says, I voted that Travis is a good guy. I don't think he's squeaky clean, but definitely not a bad guy. I have a crush on him too. <laughs> yes, Edith, I think I have a little crush on him too. I can't help myself. Beatrice uh, also says, I don't think that Travis is a bad guy, but I do think that he has things about him that we don't know yet. Absolutely, I think you guys are both right. Um, I mean, nobody's squeaky clean. Nobody's pure on this show at all. Maybe the question is, to what extent does Travis have any kind of colored history or colored past? But Shikanda at YRChat.com says, Travis was not to be trusted from the moment he started making out with Victoria while she was drunk, tipsy, and most likely vulnerable at the bar. When Victoria introduced him to Summer and Luca, the glance he gave to Luca said a lot. Those two, Travis and Luca, have definitely crossed paths before. The fact that he wouldn't even admit to knowing Luca tells me he's a bad boy. He was probably even helping the guy with the camera phone at the bar to get some good snapshots of Victoria by staging those intimate moments. I've been studying law for three years now, so maybe my dosage of skepticism is a bit too high, but I still think he was working with Luca and somewhere along the road he had a change of heart. Shakanda, I kind of like that sort of it's sort of the direction that I keep wanting to lean into. I can't help myself. But I mean, specifically that maybe he had an agenda at the beginning, but it sort of changed. But even that that more recent oil leak 
that was pretty recent. He was already pretty involved with Victoria at that point. Of course, that could have been Luca, but I, I really like that you've connected because that didn't connect with me before that uh, Luca and Travis might already know each other. Mm. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Wayne are still working up its story uh, when it comes to them, but it, I think it's certainly possible. You can't rule anything out. Angela on YouTube says, I still think that Luca might be Austin's brother or some relation to him. Hopefully, Summer gets rid of him soon. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, let's see, Nathan on YouTube says, if Chloe is revealed to be the one working with Victor, I would lose respect for her after everything that happened to her when it came to Delia's death. She doesn't owe Victor anything, but if it's Chloe who's framing Adam, then I hope Esther lays into Victor and then calls him out on his crap. <laughs> yes, Nathan. I just, I, at this point, I'm so totally convinced that Chloe is the mystery woman. I just don't believe that it's anybody else based on the Dorothy Gale thing for, for this week. That just to me is a big old smoking gun. But if you guys have other theories that if you think I'm wrong and you have other theories on uh, the, after this week's, if you're thinking somebody else is the mystery woman, definitely let me know. Aaron, on YouTube says, these police are so stupid. Adam tells them he's never been to the storage unit and then conveniently someone shows up to place false evidence in there. Don't they notice the recent fingerprints on the boxes? Cause I did. They could have run those fingerprints and storage units have cameras outside of them. Didn't they notice some woman walking in or out of the storage unit? Yes, Aaron, I didn't even think about that. It's like, why did our uses the whole security camera thing at their leisure? <laughs> Some, there's only a security camera when it fits the storyline, but that is a really good point. There should be a security camera. There, the place should have been dusted for fingerprints if it's a crime scene, at the very least the box where the where the vial was found, and it's kind of ridiculous. I don't know if maybe the YNR will go back and address that when they're putting to the pieces together that it was the mystery woman. I don't know. Daisy on Facebook says, Adam is still not off the hook, but Ian Ward escaping makes it seem like he could be guilty of setting up Adam just to get the chance to escape. And also, Adam might just be blamed for the escape, so he might end up in jail for that. Well, I had not thought of that, Daisy, but I really kind of love it because, I mean, at this point, yeah, it does kind of make it look like to the jurors, they're not going to, they're going to know that something happened out in the hallway. It kind of does make it seem like Ian could have been the whole, behind the whole thing all along. Maybe they didn't trust him, but you also make a good point that it doesn't mean that Adam is necessarily off the hook. In my mind, I was thinking maybe at least the trial is going to be postponed in order for them to do a little bit more investigating, but I wonder if it's possible that Adam sort of in correspondence with his uh, fantasy is going to end up spending at least a few nights or a little bit of time in the jail right next to Victor. Ooh. Okay, everybody, I think that takes us to the end of another YNR chat. Uh, I did look up uh, online and see that there is going to be a new episode of YNR on Monday. So yay for us. We will still get our show. Usually the holiday episodes are are just sort of relaxed. They're, it's usually a pool party or something. But I don't know how YNR is going to go from Victor getting shot and Nikki being hostage and Mariah getting bonked over the head uh, to like a 4th of July. Like barbecue. <laughs> I don't know how that's even possible. So maybe it will actually end up being a full blown episode. Fingers crossed. Because next week's going to be good. <laughs> no doubt about it. I'm going to be glued to my screen. I know you guys will too. And I know that you will be leaving me lots of comments throughout the week. You can go to yrchat.com to leave comments there. Or you can find the Facebook and YouTube page from there. You can find the podcast from there. Or, of course, you can call into the voicemail. I love hearing your voices. 309-588-4569. I will be listening and reading and loving. And I hope that everybody has, if you're in the U.S., has a really nice uh, 4th of July holiday. I know I will. Yay! <laughs> and I'll be back next Sunday to chat about our show. So, everybody, have a good one. Love ya. Bye!